Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure being here uh, among so many thought leaders, and I'm also learning at the same time. So I'm going to in, uh, introduce uh, my guest today. We have got three special guests. Uh, Mr. Smith Shah, he's the director of the Drone Federation of India. He started his career as a software developer with Gamin 8, a social intelligence company to build uh, SAAS-based data analytics products. He currently has a laser focus on the Indian drone industry and serves as the director at the Drone Federation of India. He works ardently with leading drone manufacturers, service providers, public and private uh, corporations for creating opportunities and accelerating the growth of the drone industry in India. Smith also plays a prominent role in drone policy advocacy by interacting with civil and defense government agencies and serves a member of leading government drone policy and standardization committees. Uh, he's a member of the National UTM Committee, Ministry of Civil Aviation, and his scope of the committee would be the framing of the national unmanned traffic management policy and overseeing the deployment of UTM services in India. He's also the subcommittee member for the standardization of UAVs, uh, the Bureau of Indian Standards, and that means the uh, developing the technical standards for drones and its components in India. Also with me, I've got Dr. Kakuya Iwata. He is the executive director of Juida, J-U-I-D-A. Uh, and basically he's a principal investigator of National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology. In 1998, Dr. Kakuya Iwata became a member of the Electrotechnical Laboratory belonging to the Ministry of International Trade and Industries Agency of Industrial Science and Technology. Uh, he's the, he actually has an award, the 16th Electronics Material Symposium Award and 12th Lecture Honorable Mention by the Japan Society of Applied Physics. Dr. Kakuya also is experienced in the growth of white LED development from zero to trillion yen industry. After the development of semiconductor manufacturing equipment made him interested in robotics in 2004, Dr. Kakuya transferred to the Inter Intelligence Systems Research Institute of National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology and started research and development of UAS. In 2007, he received the Outstanding Lecture Award from the Transportation and Logistics Division of the Japan Society of Mechanical Engineers. And in 2007 also, he engaged in robot policies at the Industrial Machinery Division of the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. In 2009, he launched the UAV development for the Nigata Sky Project. Locally, uh, we have Datuk Lester Tay. He is the founder and president of Malaysia UAV Development Association, or MUDA. Uh, he is also the chairman of the World UAV Federation for Malaysia chapter. He has been championing the UAV industry in Malaysia and initiated various programs and collaborations between local and regional global UAV entities for the development of technology and talents. He is currently pursuing his PhD at the Malaysia's Defence University, majoring in UAV data analytics utilising UTM systems. Muda has signed various collaboration uh, agreements and MOUs uh, with international partners like Juida, Australia UAV Academy, World UAV Federation, APEC UAV Industry Union and Oxford Aerospace Academy to bring technology transfer and training programs to the region. So um, thank you for joining me today. <laughs> A long introduction because there's you know so much credentials and credibility coming from you guys. Um, so I'm going to make it as brief as possible where possible because we understand we've got an hour to spend with you and hopefully some time to answer questions from the audience. So I'm going to just open this generally. Um, we have been talking about the pandemic and how badly it's hit most industries or some industries. But actually, according to the study by Drone Industry Insight published in April this year, in the field of software, the average increase of drone companies was actually the highest, maybe 20%. So actually, it has grown a little bit. And within the software segment, companies in the fields of flight planning, fleet and operation management and developers of the UTM systems grew more strongly than those involved in data analysis. Uh, when it comes to software sector, uh, it actually followed by the hardware companies, which recorded an average increase of 18%. And this was primarily brought by larger drone companies. As a result, the total number of new employees were also significantly higher at 16%. And within the hardware segment, passenger drone manufacturers grew particularly strong. 
And these saw large investments in the last two years, which allowed them to grow rapidly. So hopefully we can speak more about that. Commercial drone manufacturers grew also about the average at 14%. And companies from service sectors were only able to grow by an average of 11%. So um, how are the industry players in your country responding to the pandemic? And what can they contribute to ensure continuous economic growth, job creation, and safe and productive industry operations? And I will begin with Smith. You may unmute yourself. Yeah. Thanks, Anil. Uh so uh, first of all, thank you for hosting me on this session. It's wonderful to see so many people join in and uh, you know uh, build a community, a global community of collaboration. Um, you know uh, for different technologies and different uh, domains, especially you know uh, in the ASEAN region. Uh, so from a skill perspective, I believe uh, I said this in one of the last sessions as well. It's very important to understand that at least uh, uh, when we look at the India perspective. Uh, a drone uh, is one of the uh, one of the job roles, uh, the drone pilot job role. If we look at from from uh, that perspective, uh, which is one of the only ones uh, where you are not looking at uh, you know it, it's a professional job opportunity for someone who is not uh, a degree holder or who is not really going through a graduation program. So anyone can become a drone pilot, and and the uh, the salary that you get or the pay that you get uh, is not equivalent to a blue collar job, it's, it's more on the professional job side. So uh, that is one thing that we've been trying to leverage in India and for skill development, essentially, I think uh, uh, there are two things that go hand in hand. Uh, while there are companies uh, that are going to work on various skilling programs and various, uh, you know, opportunities where uh, 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 the, the, train, the people can be upskilled, but it also has to be coupled with large uh, uh, adoption programs. So in India, we have uh, two, three large programs that the government is steering, where in a in a single year, there are about 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 drone, uh, drones required for just one project. So that is the kind of opportunity that need to be created as well, so that uh, both uh, the demand as well as the skill that is being created can be uh, merged together. And it will be best if uh, the people who are at the forefront of, you know, promoting drone technology, if they keep... Uh, highlighting what skill is required and how is it required and all so that it's not just about becoming a drone pilot or just becoming a you know a, a, a drone a data processing uh, you know generalist but also uh, you know the specialist so that's that's more from the drone pilot and uh, you know that side now when we look at the software side i think it's uh, you know pretty interesting that the industry is now also focusing uh, on the on the software side where uh, I've seen a lot of companies uh, develop a very industry specific use case. Uh, so uh, the, the drone software or the drone, the software part of the drones is no longer, you know, just data processing and, uh, you know, dashboards, you know, can, can a, a CEO of a, or a industry leader of a mining company have a, you know, app in his, you know, iPad or in his, you know, sort of cell phone that gives him uh, continuous monitoring of various mining sites and, uh, the compliance reports and the progress report and all of that. So applications are going to be very industry specific from now on. Uh, that's what I think. That's where we are going. And that is also where uh, you will feel, you know, that it's not a general data processing uh, activity. It's it's niche, uh, which is why you have a, you know, industry specific solution and it's, it's more in value rather than, you know, just, just less in value where you're doing general data processing. So these are the two, three areas where I think uh, uh, collaboration needs to happen uh, in the drone pilot and uh, that side uh, more with the customer and the industry leader who's trying to bring in, uh, you know, advanced technology. So what kind of drones should we be flying and on what equipment should we be training? And on the software side, uh, uh, lies in with the customers uh, so that the software that is being developed is more focused on the user so how can a software be there to monitor, you know, the inspection of all the telecom towers that a company might own or all the mining sites that someone might own and also generate progress reports and uh, various analysis reports out of them. So that's where, uh, you know, the talent should focus. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And Dr. Kakuya, would you like to add your thoughts? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Iwata uh, Kakuya. And, uh, uh, we uh, appreciate to invite uh, and uh, giving uh, uh, very, uh, we are very honored to be here 
and uh, thank you very much for giving uh, such an opportunity to present our um, activity. So join the rest of this uh, uh, in night, uh, 2014 uh, in order to enhance the uh, uh, drone industry, not only in Japan, but also worldwide, uh, global. So uh, uh, we, uh, uh, in order to do that, uh, we have a, a lot of facility uh, about, uh, for example, uh, the uh, exhibition uh, of Japan drone, uh, and uh, also uh, test uh, drone test field. Uh, and uh, we have a educational system of a uh, Japan drone system. And also we have a, a global network uh, as shown in this figure uh, up uh, here. Uh, during uh, a lot of uh, country, a lot of uh, organization, uh, a lot of community in the world uh, has a connection to, to our JUIDA and they exchange the information about the, uh, how to enhance the in, in, uh, drone industry uh, and the, the method uh, and the uh, facility uh, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, this uh, connection and this this net global network is very in, in important. We think uh, and exchange uh, rapid in exchange uh, uh, information is very really necessary for the, each country because of that we, we ha have to negotiate uh, uh, to uh, the government uh, about the regulation of the drone and so on. So uh, in order to do that, we have. Uh, 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 information, uh, latest information is necessary to make a new uh, regulation of each, uh, each country. So uh, such a global uh, network is very import important. And also uh, we try to uh, uh, establish the international standard ISO uh, by uh, ISO TC20 uh, uh, SC16. It's, it's a, a community of uh, uh, established uh, ISO uh, for the drone uh, among the uh, system uh, in the air. So uh, we do uh, uh, creates a ISO 23665. Uh, it's ISO for the training and the education system uh, in order to uh, labelize uh, uh, the uh, uh, global uh, uh, standard for the uh, educational standard, uh, global standard uh, over uh, each uh, drone school. So, uh, and, uh, and also, uh, uh, please show this uh, slide again, please, a little moment. Uh, and also we uh, have a Japan drone exposition uh, uh, like like this uh, slide, uh, the ex 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 exhibition is very uh, necessary and uh, very important for the business of a uh, drone industry because uh, people gather here and exchange the information about the business and and create a network of the uh, for the uh, drone industry uh, enhancement uh, progress. So uh, this is very important, and we collaborate uh, at uh, any other countries in the in the world. Uh, but the uh, uh, coronavirus influence uh, the, the ex, uh, influence uh, uh, this year and the last year uh, decrease. Uh, uh, we, we can see the decrease uh, the visitors uh, a little bit, but but. Uh, 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 we uh, try to uh, online uh, exhibition system uh, in Japan around uh, 2091. So uh, the net creates thing, uh, connection and creating network uh, enhanced uh, uh, still uh, going going on. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kakuya. All right, and Dr. Dr. Lexter, would you like to add your thoughts? Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Uh, okay. So, 
Uh, thank you, moderator Hanis. Uh, uh, of course, we want to thanks to uh, Iskandar Investment Berhad, okay, and uh, Mr. Smith and Dr. Kakuya. Uh, actually, Dr. Kakuya, I think we are first time meeting. Previously, we met uh, quite sometimes with uh, Sasaki Sang and uh, Professor uh, Shinji Suzuki Sensei. Yeah, so uh, we have been very pleasure to work with. Uh, Juida, uh, which is an international body and a well-known organization in an uh, international platform of, uh, for the NGO and education, uh, drone education. So for as for MUDA, Malaysia uh, UAV Development Association, we are actually have the mission and the, we have the vision of we uh, have the drone empowerment to Malaysia and the application uh, for Malaysia to disrupt the industry, the conventional industry, which we cater for, even for agriculture, we have about 1.3 trillion uh, uh, GDP uh, contribution uh, from uh, our industry. So we are actually want to grow and we want to create the environment and the platform uh, for the industry players to come along and network together. And then we have a uh, more synergy uh, synergetic uh, relationship and uh, growth for the industry so uh, well i because i from our platform we actually uh, cater uh, already uh, three governments uh, from uh, the prime minister i think six and seven and eight now so <laughs> we have many government changes uh, but uh, somehow rather the drone it doesn't stop the drone uh what i call the drone uh, industry's growth and then it grows even stronger and uh faster uh we we want to thanks for, for previous three previous uh uh prime minister and the premier of malaysia which are whatever our implement our our white paper and our initiative of the uh what we call um the suggestion and uh, comments uh, that we wrote into each of the ministry were uh, tabled and and taken into consideration to the cabinet and then they make changes in allocation of the funding of the subsidies to each of the ministry so it comes to uh, the result now that you can see most of the ministry even the kdn now so you can see their budgets uh, for uh, the drone application and the drone usage uh by agriculture also uh, ministry of transportation and the ministry of education uh, each of the ministry that play a big role so really grateful and very thankful for the initiative and then for uh as an ngo leader and uh, uh we, we want we, we are we are very thankful and then we can see a lot of uh, captain of the industry is still growing and then growing very big uh in malaysia uh, they're spawning and even though they are complaining about the regulation or constraint but they are growing very very big compared to other country uh, which i think is a very good improvement uh, and i will give a uh, what i call the compliment to, to the government actually to facilitate uh, them to grow so fast and uh, to a very high level of um, and high value of uh, what i call uh, enterprise yeah thank you dr lester and we obviously have a big role to play as association uh, associations we need to actually build the ecosystem together uh, in terms of visibility for the drone companies um, and also to of course be updated on the latest technology and getting uh, funding uh, for the community right um so i'm just going to jump to my first question for mr smith um, drone Federation of India members now has over 2,000 drone pilots, 120 plus service providers, 80 plus manufacturers, and 10 plus training organizations. In the business standard really recently, they published that you mentioned that India needs to research um, counter drone technology. And what's next? How is DFI making an impact in India's growing industry? So we're doing two things for uh, you know the next set of impact. Uh, uh, we, we are now uh, shifting our focus uh, from regulations to, uh, you know, opportunity creation. So uh, working with the government and working with large corporations to uh, promote the use of drones, uh, educate them on uh, uh, 
uh, how drones can bring in uh, you know significant advantage to their businesses uh, so that the uh, uh, opportunity for the drone industry uh, becomes large and becomes big so we have one of the programs that we already have is the swamitva project which is uh, a project that uh, uses survey grade drones to uh, do property uh, mapping across uh, uh, 600000 uh, more than 600000 villages across india so imagine it's 600000 villages being mapped uh, in a single project and uh, more than 900 million lives uh, being you know uh, uh, be getting the benefit at the end of the survey they get all get a property card and then they can take this property card and then go to you know banks and get financial loans and and start businesses and all of that which was not not uh, clear it was there in some parts but it was not absolutely clear in the village uh, in the rural part of india so that's just one project we are trying to create many more such projects in uh, the telecom space in the mining space in the agriculture space uh, with both government as well as uh, a private corporations so that we can quickly see large customers adopting drones in in large volumes so uh, that is the opportunity that we are trying to create so that's one Uh, second uh, we have also started to uh, uh, bring in a dialogue on the counter drone uh, you know sort of systems uh, what happens is currently the counter drone systems there's been a lot of uh, 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 secretive or sort of uh, very limited uh, discussions on that uh, some very limited company is trying to develop the solution and then working with the defense forces and all but there is no dialogue so we are trying to build a dialogue on the counter drone space uh, you know a uh, very recent example that all of you are aware uh, in jammu uh, in india uh, someone you know sort of dropped two explosives in the jammu air force station uh, so uh, that is been actually one of the points uh, with which we are trying to educate everyone and say that you know no amount of policy or or any kind of uh, you know checks and balances that you bring in uh, in in your own drone ecosystem uh, is going to you know stop someone from just assembling a rogue drone and then flying it and dropping something so if someone wants to actually fly a drone and uh, do mischief or do something bad uh, no policy is stopping them there is no regulation that can stop so the only thing that can stop is uh, local intelligence which which our governments know very well and uh, counter drone technology so that's where we are trying to build the you know sort of dialogue so that we create more opportunities and hence more uh, drones can be you know sort of sold uh, more drones can be used for services more pilots can come in and uh, we we balance it with the counter drone discussion so that anyone who thinks that you know if there are too many drones is it a privacy risk or a safety risk and all of that so you bring in with the counter drone discussion that uh, if you put counter drone systems at adequate places uh, you will not have you know bad drones coming in and and the drone technology can keep accelerating so that's that's where we are trying to go next thank you mr smith and dr kakuya um you've shown us amazing development in the japan industry drone industry um we saw that your event was very well received despite the people um not traveling as much you still managed to get about 12000 people visiting um the expo and okay. recently japanese drones have um usually traditionally relied on chinese electronics and of course now will be expected to lead in local innovations so do we share with us on the latest developments in the japan drone industry in terms of innovations yes uh, mainly in japan uh, the creation of a new application uh, is uh, now Uh, in progress, and uh, uh, we we have a uh, a lot of uh, educated people. We we we, ja, we do ja, do that create uh, educated people. People uh, educated means a uh, uh, safety educated educated people. It's a, a very uh, good thing for uh, the uh, keep a uh, uh, so, social uh, safety and. and then not use the counter drone <laughs> like like you uh, that and uh, uh, these uh, people are uh, kind of uh, amount of people uh, create a, uh, have a uh, obtain the job drone a job using a drone and create a new job uh, using drone uh, and create a new application uh, such a power of uh, 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 enhancing the uh, Jap uh, Japanese drone uh, industry. And also the location is very important. Uh, the right side uh, figure shows uh, uh, 
location of a Japanese uh, Juida drone school, uh, school uh, educational system. Uh, uh, drone uh, capability of a drone is uh, really large. Uh, for example, for the agriculture and uh, industry and fa factory uh, uh, inspection of the factory and uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, but it's a uh, different between the uh, uh, location and and. and Area and this industry, so uh, we uh, necessary to create such a uh, educated people uh, all over the uh, Japan, all over the world, uh, in in order to fix the drone application uh, of, of, of to the uh, local uh, uh, condition uh, of uh, local community as uh, society. So uh, it's uh, so it's a uh, purpose uh, of uh, uh, created uh, people, safety people, uh, safety educated people in uh, by the uh, Jida drone school. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then, um, okay, all right. And uh, Lester, my, my next question comes to you. Uh, the Malaysian drone market is expected to grow to USD 300 million in revenue by 2025. And just a few days ago, the Royal Malaysia Police announced that it would actually invest 48 million ringgit for 16 VTOL drones. And these drones will be used for observation and threat prevention at the country's border areas in an effort to curb intrusion, smuggling, and cross border crime. Uh, would you know if these uh, drones are actually locally manufactured? or are they in partnership with international companies? And how is the Malaysian private drone sector working together with government to grow local talent and accelerate R&D efforts in order to provide to local and international needs? Okay, Hanis? Oh, interesting. Well, suddenly you have a very current issue. Huh? Okay, so uh, this is a very hot topic that we talk about in our groups and uh, many of the group chat and whatnot for the eight, 48 million uh, procurement from uh, only the police, the what we call PGU uh, is our airwing, uh, police airwing. So, uh, but uh, from my, the intelligence that we got, uh, the information we, we see is actually one third of the budget is uh, catered for the uh, veto. Vito drone, so it's about 16 million, which is about 1 million each for the 16 uh, units of Vito. And then the rest are catered for about like, like the vehicle, 175 units of vehicle and 1000 of the bulletproof vests and uh, the knife, utility knives and, and whatnot. So, but uh, after all, th this is a very good initiative that we can see the for the border security, we are starting to use uh, the the from the home affair home affair uh, ministries that they are allocating for you know such a big amount you know it's about four is about it's about more than it's more than ten million US dollars you see so from uh, the statistic that you got from me uh, three hundred million US dollar revenue by twenty twenty five but from the statistic I get uh, is actually that by twenty twenty three we already can achieve three hundred and six million uh, revenue so in in other words we are actually talking about if we can get a profit of about us dollar 61.2 million which is about uh 263 millions of ringgit malaysia so we can actually uh, create from the out of the 263 uh, millions profit we can have the national incomes of about 63 million for a year so down the road, if you have the route map, you can see actually Malaysia can create about 630 million uh, ringgit for the national revenue directly from the profit of the drone industry itself. So this is uh, our, our forecast and the market analysis, uh, which we, we believe that the drone technology transformation is taking place to convert and translate transformations of conventional industry from the energy, construction, 
agriculture, transportation, infrastructure, information and motion pictures, uh, real estate, industry, parks, healthcare and disaster relief, education, scientific and technical, mining and quarry, insurance, public emergency uh, services, and, and, and so on. So we can talk about the direct and indirect incomes and the direct and direct uh, industry, which is from the upstream to the downstream of the supply chain within the industry is very lucrative and actually is actually uh, disrupting a lot of conventional, uh, big conventional uh, industry in Malaysia from the, uh, especially is very in line to the IR 4.0, which they have uh, a lot of startup or the venture capitalists uh, is looking for the jargon that whoever, you know, go towards the uh, augmented intelligence, augmented, uh, what we call the, the reality uh, or AI, you know, artificial intelligence powered or driven kind of uh, software pro processing and the powerhouse or whatnot. So uh, for my for my points of view, I'm, I see this is how private sectors uh, is very integrated and uh, what we call and integrated and can materialize the potential of the market opportunities in Malaysia with a uh, good revenue and a good expect market expectation. Yeah. Okay. So do you do you think um, how how do we actually um, improve? in terms of our own R&D and in, in terms of our own innovations because um, most of the questions that come my way, I'm also part of an association, they're saying that the local manufacturers are not getting um, business that are actually given to international manufacturers. So how will you encourage the government to look more into the local manufacturers? Um, okay. For this point of view, I think you play a very uh, good standing, which I, I've been doing it uh, for so many years, which by the NGO or the industries, uh, what I call the, the, the association, we can actually bridge bringing the gaps, the certification gaps or the strategy gaps for the framework to bring over the international players into Malaysia and then let them take part in the local environment. So to create the, the complete ecosystem, or we call it a ho more holistic com uh, e ecosystem, which we have the comprehensive software, hardware, and also the platform uh, assembly or uh, what we call uh, uh, research, or we can have more innovation uh, you know, uh, uh, section or the workshop in, in Malaysia. So Malaysia, Malaysia is actually born to have a, the, the the strategic uh, location in Southeast Asia and as well as the uh, Asia. And then we have a, a, what we call a very good uh, friendly environment for the, the, the local player and as well as the international player, which I think part last week I saw that there's some good initiative from the MITI. Uh, they're given the very good initiative for the uh, international players to come into Malaysia and then we actually welcome all over the world like even India, Japan, everywhere, US, China, we don't have the war, the trade war, we don't have the, we are very peace in, uh, we are very peace and a friendly uh, country for all the, we, we can accept most of the country to, to come into Malaysia uh, to, to do business and to grow. That's why even the Japan, a uh, big company, the drone company also established their, their base here. And then some of the US companies coming here. Then most of the China company, which I brought in uh, past few years is actually establish something, uh, the, some assembly plant or whatever here. No, it's, it's very good, uh, what I call, um, incubated place as well as a business or commercial area for the international platform. So I think you play a very good role, which you have to bring over more players to come in and facilitate them in Malaysia by using whatever facility and whatever policy that given by the government and empowered to the industry to do it. So we can have more competitive or friendly competitive uh, competition in Malaysia. So by by integration of uh, and consolidation of more businesses in Malaysia, the drone businesses, we can actually uh, spearhead from Southeast Asia or from Malaysia to all over uh, the region or to other countries. Yeah. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Lester. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And now that we have DRZ, there's actually a, bet, a very good space for people, uh, for international and local companies to get together and create something um, of international standard. Um, so my next question goes to Mr. Smith. Um, India has definitely has one, one of the biggest market potential growth in terms of demand and supply. What are the biggest challenges faced by your industry partners in realizing this potential in terms of talent, technology adoption, awareness, and how is DFI helping to bridge the gap? Thanks for that question. I think uh, a few of the problems uh, that we had uh, were uh, first to do with the policy. Uh, so the drone policy, actually, uh, we in India, we had a complete ban in 2014, then we had some draft policies uh, between 2014 and 2018. Then 2018, we had another policy uh, uh, which which talked about the NPNT system and digital sky. 2020-21 uh, March, we had another policy update uh, which was the UAS rules 2021. And in fact, uh, uh, for for people who are not aware. Uh, just about uh, uh, two weeks back, uh, a revised version of the drone policy has been released in India. And uh, all requirements of uh, security, clearance, licenses, permissions, everything has been dropped. Uh, in fact, the government has taken a 180 degree turn from being a regulatory uh, control sort of a regime to a trust-based regulation. Uh, so India has, uh, you know, I would, I would just say that all the policy problems that existed uh, for anything to do with drones has been solved once and for all. Whether we talk about the visual line of sight uh, uh, drone applications or even the beyond visual line of sight drone applications, uh, uh, we will probably not have many policy issues with the Indian market. So that's solved. That was a problem till now. Recently solved about two weeks back. This is also uh, 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 one of the, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, areas where industry and uh, government has collaborated and has been trying to you know sort of educate the government since long and uh, uh, this policy was announced uh, just uh, uh, a week after what happened at jammu so uh, it's it's important to understand that in a market where in india uh, we were always talking about npnt and digital sky and all of that uh, you know giving per giving permission without which you cannot take off from that kind of a mindset and then Jammu happening, uh, you know, everyone, uh, you know, the, the self-proclaimed experts were all talking about, you know, uh, there is a need for strict drone policy and all of that. But in fact, the government just did opposite. You know, the government said, uh, you know, there is a strict policy in place. And, uh, and you know, irrespective of that policy, someone came, you know, right into our Air Force station and, and dropped a small explosive. I mean, it's, it's a very small explosive, no, no loss of, uh, you know, life and all of that, no, nothing major. But... You know, someone did that. So if someone can actually do it, then what, what, what is the policy, you know, uh, how is the policy addressing all of that? So uh, the policy was, you know, sort of reformed. And uh, now the 80 page policy, as I like to compare is, uh, is a five page policy and uh, no security requirements, uh, no licenses. In fact, no licenses for manufacturing at all. Uh, it, it's almost similar to the automobile industry. Uh, when you're selling the drone, you need to be certified. And if you are flying the drone, you need to have a pilot uh, certification. After that, uh, for most of the areas in India, if you are flying up to 400 feet, you don't require any permission. So no permission up to 400 feet. Uh, in yellow zones, which is near the uh, airports, there will be some permission required, which we are you know, uh, looking forward that it will be a 24 hour uh, based time window for getting the permission. And red zones, which will be the uh, defense installations or the military installations will be uh, probably another few uh, uh, two, three, two days or five days to get the permission to fly in that area. Uh, so that's the policy problem. Uh, next issues were some around uh, certification uh, uh, of the drone. Uh, so we have some uh, some challenges around that on how to, you know, what part of the drone to certify, uh, whether we focus more on cybersecurity or we focus more on the electronics. Uh, we have to focus on all, but where do we start from? So that's one thing that we are uh, already, you know, in dialogue with and we're trying to solve it. Uh, and the third most important is now the local manufacturing. Uh, so with the policy being easy now, uh, we are expecting uh, some uh, incentives by the government uh, to ensure that you know local manufacturing can be boosted. And uh, uh, that's 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 the few areas that we are working on. So policy solved. Uh, 
you know incentives coming soon and uh, certification will be looked at uh, you know in in due course of time sounds like a good time to be in india definitely <laughs> yeah. to be in india and anything to do with drones india probably is one of the one of the top 10 countries now or top 5 countries now where you will get all the freedom to sort of uh, experiment and uh, develop any any kind of solutions uh, you know uh, in the drone ecosystem fantastic thank you mr smith and now my question goes to dr um transforming mobility systems requires an integrated perspective numerous disruptions are required not just to vehicles which might even uh, might even include unmanned aerial transport but also to energy lines energy grids um mm -hmm. connectivity mm -hmm. networks mm -hmm. and delivery logistics so public and private players must join hands to accommodate and optimize the additional demand for and for for demand for and presence of mobility services so led by local governments ecosystems consisting of oems technology players telcos utilities and urban planners uh, should be formed to pilot and deliver effective and efficient solutions so juida is expanding and accelerating activities for the next generation mobility systems such as flying cars urban mm -hmm. air mobility e-vtol mm -hmm. aerial taxis uh, very exciting times the, the future is now and can you share what activities are planned in the near future and the challenges that you foresee okay thank you uh, it's good good question uh, we uh, we think uh, the important thing is uh, understanding of a uh, present technology for the drone. And also uh, we need uh, to think about, uh, discuss about the future uh, technology of drone. So uh, what is the future uh, for, uh, for drone? It's a really important thing. Uh, moving something and moving people uh, is one of the, uh, Drone future, we think. So uh, we uh, collaborate and they exchange the information uh, between Canada and the EU uh, about the uh, UAM, uh, urban air mobility, and the passenger drone, uh, as shown in this figure. Uh, and also the understanding of the technology in order to do that is very important uh, for the drone community. So we uh, create a uh, uh, Technology journal of advanced mobility, uh, as shown in this figure, uh, is a slide, uh, and they share the uh, uh, information and the te uh, technology uh, about the drone, uh, and and we uh, uh, we, we need a uh, preparation for the future of drone. Uh, so uh, we uh, it's necessary for the share. The, uh, the latest uh, technology uh, drawn by such a uh, lit lit literature, a technology journal, uh, we think. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kakuya. And we've got my third question. Um, this will be the last question that is from myself and the team. Um, oh, yeah. after, after that, we'll be opening it up to the public. All right. So uh, for the public you're viewing, do leave your question in the chat box and we will get our panelists to reply to your questions. So um, this will be addressed to Dr. Lester. Um, Okay, so MUDA and World UAV Malaysia was initiated by yourself since 2018. How do you see Malaysia progressing in drone industry uh, compared to our regional counterparts? And what are the big gaps that we need to fill more urgently? Okay. Um, there are actually several uh, perspectives from the demand, the adoption, technology, and the policy. So the Policy-wise, is the most trickiest part, which we have the certification gaps and the strategy. So the grab the gaps in existing certification framework, which we have to meet the standard and the methods for the system redundancy and failure management, which many of the many of the uh, what we call the engineers or manufacturer or the players in Malaysia uh, could not have the the compet uh, competency in this sector so then a uh, multi-copter will need a standard for how subsystem subsystems such as distributed electric uh, propulsions or energy storage which will re 
address the redundancy and the failure. Uh, we like the helicopter that they, they can have, they may have a redundancy engine, redundant engine, and can auto ro ro rotate to handle certain failures. But for drone, we at the moment, uh, apart from DJI, I think uh, many other drones uh, do not have the competency to, to handle the, the failure. Okay, then we also have to determine the standard for a failure scenario for an autonomous uh, vehicle which the remote pilots or the operators will be available to take over for whatever requirement. And then uh, also the medical requirement, is there any requirement for uh, medical requirement for any pilots or operators? Okay, then we also have to define how an autonomous, autonomous vehicle uh, make judgment in a failure scenario, which literally the standard for the landing, the takeoff, and when you practice and how close are you in the uh, non-fly area and non-fly zone. So this is more to the certification gaps for the, the, the operators, for the aircraft, as well as for the area to fly. So there are the, there is also the strategy uh, strategies uh, gaps, which uh, we are considering in the framework. So we have to review the domestic and the international airworthiness regulation and support supporting industry standard and identify potential strategy. So the strategy depend on vehicle characteristics such as propulsions and aircraft design and may leverage in the part 21.17b to take parts like the part 23, 27, 20, uh, 33 and, and so on for the, uh, for, the, for, for the FAA or now we are actually complying the ESA standards. Uh, Malaysia, most of Malaysia is complying ESA standard, but we also have to develop a new strategy requirement to support the certification. So uh, I, 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 I was amazed with DRIDA's, uh, what we call, uh, they're going forward to very systematic, um, systematic standardized for their their, their strategy to comply and to propose to the government how they can come about the strategy to close the gaps. So uh, we are actually trying hard uh, in uh, part of MUDA. Uh, we will try to play the industry parks as well as uh, the association parks to give more um, feedback to the authority. Okay, and then for technology parks, I think we definitely uh, do not have problem now because everywhere of the world, even in Malaysia, we have few universities doing the research on uh, what we call on the, the, the veto that can carry up to 300 or 500 kilograms of uh, payload and then can fly up to an hour. So uh, they are actually doing the research from southern part of UTM, uh, UTHM, uh, even to UITM, uh, there are so many universities doing the research. Okay, so uh, for the adoption, I think it's more to the public perception. Public perception as well as uh, the, what we call, uh, uh, technology or, or the industry um, acceptance, especially the conventional industry. Yeah. So, uh, but for Malaysia, I don't think it's a problem because we adopted very exponentially uh, in Malaysia. Uh, okay, for the demand, I think there are few constraint and uh, unconstrained scenario, uh, which uh, I see the demand is growing in, uh, very, very uh, tremendously, uh, be it in the agriculture to to the telecommunication towers, uh, to the oil and gas industry. So I think the demand is very, very high in Malaysia. And then we are trying to do a benchmark, benchmarking for the regional uh, area like the Thailand, Indonesia, even Vietnam. Just let me share a little bit of the uh, data, uh, which the drone sales in Malaysia for DJI is actually number one in Malaysia. Even we are having, uh, I think less than 10 uh, times of population of Indonesia, but we actually become the number one uh, outstanding uh, Thailand and in, uh, Indonesia. So uh, I'm very confident that uh, our initiative actually works and then given a very good result, uh, big or small, uh, especially in the industry base for the demand adoption technology and as well as the policy. And then I have to give a uh, good credit to the 
a civil aviation authority which uh, unlike uh, some of the country like even smith also uh, saying that they have a lot of ban here and there and the, the difficulty but here our civil aviation authority is actually working hard to facilitate and provide the guidelines and directive and we have a future proof roadmap uh, that is going on to draft to be drafted so i think uh, from the march 1st of march uh, 2021's uh, directive it shows that a very good effort that uh, they already put in from uh, past few years nothing there no guideline nothing uh, until we have actually something to to depend on and something to follow and then uh, uh, for the for the few cad which is, uh, cater for the 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 talents uh, the operators or the pilots uh, as well as the aircraft and as well as the special aircraft for different zone uh, all those is uh, more most of it uh, adoption from the esr but we are in a very fast pace to actually adopt it and then we try to implement it as soon as possible yeah so i think there's a very good initiative from them yeah Thank you so much, Dr. Lester. Um, yeah, we, I think we definitely have pro uh, progressed in terms of policy making. Um, there's a lot of table talks going on, virtually of course, among drone players, industry, you know, universities, academia, and government government officials. So, uh, it's it's a very good sign for us because we can see that it's growing exponentially, as you said. So, my next question comes from the audience for Mr. Smith. India is now opening the market for Chinese drones. Uh, this was published in some news outlets two days ago. Um, what brought this about and is it real? So India has simplified the regulations for uh, everyone. Uh, it's, it's not specifically Chinese. Uh, there was some someone in the news who just you know sort of twisted it like that. But essentially any company, whether local or global, will be able to come to India and set up shop. Uh, there may be some uh, uh, provisions for uh, promoting uh, local manufacturing. Uh, that's that's what that is about, and you know, some some one or two companies gave some statements, and that was brought in the news and highlighted. But uh, uh, regulations opened up for everyone, and uh, some incentive and some uh, 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 some incentive happening for local manufacturing. That's that's what that news was about. <laughs> All right, thank you for clarification. And um, I would like to ask um, this to Dr. Kakuya from the audience as well. How, how are other markets in ASEAN developing their own drone ecosystem? How can Juida and actually DFI support the regional ecosystem development? Uh, Dr. Kakuya, maybe you can answer them later. Mr. Smith can add on. Uh, okay, uh, Juida uh, has a a solution about uh, 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 not only the drone itself but also the drone player uh, through the uh, educational system and so on so the education is very uh, basic uh, uh, facility uh, for the uh, society so uh, GW uh, uh, help the uh, community and the uh, ecosystem uh, by the uh, uh, through the educational system. I think, uh, for example, uh, uh, ISO to see seven six five and so on. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kakuya and Mr. Smith, would you like to add to that? I think uh, uh, one thing that uh, we all should focus on is uh, you know harmonization. So you. <laughs> Uh, create some kind of a uh, you know e equivalence in terms of various uh, uh, training programs or various certifications uh, both the uh, the certification of the pilot as well as the equipment uh, that is where we will all be able to contribute uh, uh, and and uh, join our efforts and any new ecosystem probably if they want to come ahead as well they will not need to uh, you know restart they, they can just you know adopt something uh, that is not accepted just in one country let's say for example i am not talking about something that is adopted from juida or japan uh, or just from India, but you know Japan, India, and various ASEAN countries working together so that anyone who joins in uh, takes something that is accepted across ASEAN and probably then glo the globe as well. So that's that's where you know two two specific points: uh, certification of the drone and the certification of the drone pilot. If this can be made equivalent in most of our ecosystems, uh, probably a lot of problems get solved. 
All right, so standardization across the region for, for education-based uh, pilot training, for example, and um, ISO uh, qualifications for the parts and the, the hardware and software, I suppose, right? Uh, Dr. Lester, would you like to add anything to this? Oh, I think definitely it's a very good idea we should have a standard uh, for the certification among the region. Uh, but uh, it seems like Malaysia is actually more advanced in this in the, this space, which we already have the, our uh, CAD, the Civil Aviation Directive, which we have uh, five parts. Uh, but the most important part, the first part is actually the UAS Remote Pilot Training Organization, which is cater for more to auto, authorize uh, training uh, organization uh, is a very proper and uh, I think world, worldwide recognized uh, certification for uh, the proper aviation practice. So we, we are actually going towards this direction and uh, to, to, to eliminate all the ambiguity or confusions among whoever have a standard of certification, whoever have like the Australian in, uh, accreditation or, or China or wherever. So this is, uh, I think, the most standard uh, outline or directive that we actually follow. And then it can be materialized, I uh, hopefully by end of the the year or or by the first quarter of uh, next year. So I I think it's good for even India and Japan to come and uh, uh you know study how we gonna do it because it, actually this is a very comprehensive one and uh, among our industry we have few players that is really working hard on uh doing this and materialize this for the Malaysian uh, drone industry. And it, it, I assure you, this is a very high standard and, and uh, international on pass level. Yeah, we, we can have more interaction on this. Yeah. Great. So that's that's opportunity for us to get together again in the near future. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, mm. uh, it's ex exciting times. I think all of us are pushing forward this uh, the drone ecosystem. And I think hand in hand, when we work with our own um, civil aviation authorities as well, this would materialize uh, soon enough. So I've got a last question for all of you. Um, what is your view about the development of an initiative like the drone and robotic zone in Iskandar? So Dr. Lester, you might uh, begin first. Oh, okay. Uh, I think Iskandar, uh, Iskandar is a very good place uh, for the for for every country to come in, uh, and it is a very strategic uh, southern area which we can direct actually can directly uh, get in Singapore players, which we can provide a, a more uh, test bed or the flying zone uh, for them to fly. I I believe they have a lot of talents in the. Uh, uh, data uh, processing and uh, uh, piloting and as well as the software testing and the hardware testing uh, talents but they do not really have a good place to fly so I think Iskandar is actually providing a very good enabling country's uh, platform to fly and then actually we can uh, indirectly we can uh, promote more in Malaysia and then we can have more technology updates uh, uh, with our our uh, talents in Malaysia so uh, but I think for not also not very far from uh, they have an international airport there Sunai airport which you can actually fly from uh, Tokyo uh, Japan Shibuya for or, or India you know they can fly over here uh, within a few hours so it's a very strategic place and then we, I, I hope we can actually uh, have more activities and event uh, international event or regional events in uh, this region and then we uh, Muda will definitely Muda already have one uh, near Peling uh, uh, JB so uh, one branch so we, we hope our branch can interact uh, with uh, this Iskandar region more and then we can have uh, interaction or we can even establish one more branch or the test bed in Iskandar to, to have more members to participate in for, for the testing or for the, for the exchange of knowledge or how to commercialize their, their products or services or consultancy in this region. It's a very good initiative. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Lester. And Mr. Smith, uh, would, you, would you like to set up here in DRZ? Definitely. I mean, if we have to work together uh, with everyone, then there is a, a single place where everyone needs to come in as well. While we can keep interacting virtually and all of that, but it's also important that we 
uh, set up physical infrastructure and we all come together look at it uh, you know uh, discuss there uh, build capacity there and then take the learnings back to each of our countries so that uh, you know we can have some kind of a harmonization i think it's it's one of the perfect examples of what you know a drone company would require to you know sort of experiment with all the freedom and have all the best in class facilities uh, so they don't really need to worry about all of this they just get a you know a green green zone where you know do whatever you want and it is a fantastic uh, ecosystem that being developed uh, you know the drv thank you mr state and uh, dr kakuya will be seeing you here soon i hope in drz <laughs> Yeah, we are very appreciate it to uh, obtain such a opportunity to make it a agent a network. So thank you very much. Thank you guys. Um, all right. So I'd like to thank my panelists. Um, we have actually some requests on how to connect with you individually. Um. Actually, in the networking page, you would have the contact details of our panelists, um, also the other delegates, so you can connect to each other during and after the event. Um, yeah. So if if you like to actually also connect to me, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm also part of the Malaysian Autonomous Intelligence and Robotics Intel uh, Robotics Association, and we do have actually um, casual chats on Clubhouse every fortnight. So if you'd like to just listen in, uh, do follow me so you can have uh, the link. All right. So thank you again, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Kakuya and Dr. Lesser for joining us today and sharing your super insights with the audience. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you guys again. Thank you.